Hello and welcome to Africa Now, the podcast that takes a fresh look at events on the continent and at how Africa relates to the rest of the world. I'm Martine Dennis. Today, why are police officers from Kenya being sent to Haiti, where gang violence is tearing the Caribbean country apart? South Africa's ANC loses a senior figure. Mavusu Msimang, a party stalwart for 60 years, quits over entrenched corruption and says his beloved party's prospects in next year's elections don't look at all good. As COP28 wraps up in Dubai, did Africa get what it wanted? We ask a Nigerian energy consultant, and we hear from a rather frustrated Ghanaian delegate. Plus, Tinubu's enormous delegation to COP28, Nigerians are up in arms, and find out why Rwanda's president could be rubbing his hands with glee. With me as ever are the redoubtable duo, Donu Kogbrush is in Abuja and Patrick Smith. They will help me make sense of things, but let's get straight to it. We're going to go straight to Nairobi and speak to Irungu Houghton, who is Executive Director of Amnesty International in Kenya. And um, Irungu, start at the beginning. How did this idea, this concept come about of a thousand Kenyan police officers going to the Caribbean nation of Haiti? Thank you very much for having me on. I think the um, starting point from this was really a conversation that took place on the margins of one of the UN General Assembly conversations uh, earlier this year. And um, I think the interest of the Kenyan government has been primarily threefold. The first is that they say this is an act of Pan-African solidarity. They also, we also know that this was a request that was made explicitly by the US government uh, to them. And I think the third um, incentive really is that there is a promise of $237 billion that would be um, essentially contributing to this mission, so that the police would essentially be funded to do this. And and what are your concerns about it, Irungu? Because on the face of it, I I guess there are not many Kenyan police officers who speak French or Creole. Um, And how experienced are they in dealing with what is criminal gang warfare? Well, I I think, first of all, just uh, as Amnesty International, of course, we have an international mandate. So we follow very closely the violence that has been um, racking uh, Haiti for many years now, many decades of um, unstable governance. Um, And, you know, at the moment, we know that there are about 8,000 people either dead, injured, or have disappeared under the weight of criminal gangs. 80% of Port-au-Prince is under the control of criminal gangs, not the government of Haiti. So we have to start by saying that there is a humanitarian and a human rights disaster in Haiti. But I think our major concern with the proposal to deploy Kenyan police officers has been, uh, it came at a time when we've seen absolutely no accountability for the police violence that um, took place over 2023. There has been no single police officer or their commanding officer arrested for the uh, tens of deaths. About 50 people have died as a result of police violence in um, uh, policing protests earlier this year. And we've had hundreds of people hospitalized and and injured as a result of um, unlawful and excessive use of force. So our major concern has been this is not the time to essentially elevate this to an international stage. Um, and secondly, you know, uh, been, there's been very little uh, evidence of uh, pre-deployment human rights training that's going into the 1,000 police officers that are going to join the 2,500 that will uh, stabilize situation in, in Haiti. So our major concern is that without pre-deployment human rights training, and without a clear oversight accountability mechanisms, um, we would not want to see the kind of uh, militarization that we saw uh, as people express themselves um, in terms of just lawful protest. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the Kenyan police force don't exactly have a reputation for being terribly observant of, of human rights. Um, so presumably, if they enter into this fray that's taking place in the Caribbean, it's, it's not going to end well. Well, I mean, of course, we can't, we, nothing is ine- inevitable, but we have to say that the conditions at the moment do not exist for, a, uh, for confidence in terms of this. Most Kenyans are, you know, range from sceptical to against this policy um, or this proposal to have Kenyan officers go there. And part of this is to do with what we've seen in the Kenyan context, but it's also to do with 
whether we are putting police officers in harm's way. There have been three risk assessments that have, uh, uh, sorry, three, three missions that have uh, departed to Haiti in the last three or four months. And uh, as early as last week, the Prime Cabinet Secretary in charge of Foreign Affairs was very clear uh, outreach to community leaders, to the media, um, to civil society organizations and to politicians. And the danger is that, you know, you could have um, 2,500 police officers parachuted into a context in which there is no acceptance for them. And there is no capacity that's been built for them, as you say, to be able to interact and to be able to de-escalate violence using either Creole or even French. But of course, most of Haitians don't speak French uh, naturally. They speak Creole. Irungu, who is paying for all this? Is it the Americans? And is Kenya really just doing Joe Biden a favor? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems that the financing is coming primarily from the Americans. We had um, a senior secretary of state in Kenya a few months ago, essentially to reach agreement with the Kenyan government. And it seems that the delays are not just to do with this uh, high court uh, stay that was secured earlier last month, but it is to do also with clarity about whether the money will be front-loaded um, before the police officers leave um, uh, Kenya. And uh, therefore, um, you know, the, the resources will be found prior to them arriving in Haiti. And that's, that's one of the major concerns. Uh, what, what about the drug, the drug scene in, in, in Haiti? Because there are these, one of the American concerns is not really, seems to be about governance, but more about uh, um, interdicting the, the drugs gangs that have been operating in and around Haiti. Do you think the Kenyan cops are just going to get thrown into some really complex policing mission trying to trying to break up drugs cartels? Yes, I mean, it's, it's extremely complex all around. I think you've got a number of things happening. Um, so you've got the drug cartels. You've also got uh, the drugs going into the United States, America, and then being returned um, in the form of weapons. And I think the other thing that many of us have been arguing is that the United States government could do more in terms of stemming the flow of illegal weapons into Haiti and essentially equipping these criminal gangs to be able to continue with the narcotics trade. So I think those are, that's the other piece of the puzzle that I think we have to demand that if there is to be a post a stabilization program, that there has to be a disarmament and a choking of uh, weapons um, from the US into Haiti. I mean, I, I, mean, I find it extraordinary that people from East Africa are being shipped across to the Caribbean. And, you know, there's this assumption that just because we're all black, that there's some kind of cultural, um, you know, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word at the moment. But affinity. Affinity, exactly, exactly. And, and you, you know, I'm, I'm shocked that they're not getting in-depth cultural training as well as the human rights training that you suggested, because they are going to find Haitians completely different from the people back home. And they are going to make blunders based on inadequate understanding of the local terrain and the mindset and culture of the, of the local Haitian people. No, this is a spot on concern. I mean, when this was first muted back in September, we did a round of, um, uh, I guess, advocacy and lobbying pitches to the Kenyan government. And we reminded them that the cultural context is very different. Um, in some ways, it's even more different than um, Kenyan police officers found in places like Liberia and Sierra Leone, where we do have a record. And maybe it's worth noting that there is a history of Kenyan police officers creating police services across uh, West Africa successfully, I should mention, or the Kenyan government and a uh, number of humanitarian experts being involved in the AU post-conflict uh, reconstruction and development policy, which is a flagship uh, policy for many um, post-conflict situations. But the reality is that, you know, we, we have extremely few, I probably less than a handful, if, if that possibly even not even one or two police officers who speak French, um, very, very few police officers who speak Creole, and uh, very little experience of working in a Haitian context, which is not just complex presently, it's historically complex because you've had um, a wave after wave of UN uh, peacekeepers, humanitarian officers, 
um, trying to stabilize the situation in Haiti unsuccessfully. And in some cases, even simple things like introducing, um, you know, uh, uh, non-communicable diseases like cholera uh, to Haiti in, in a manner in which um, you saw, you know, lots of lives lost as a result of this. Or uh, may I add also sexual and uh, gender-based violence um, and sexual intimidation um, by these um, peacekeepers and humanitarian officers. So we have to tread very carefully and therefore pre-deployment training is very important. These are not Burundians who speak French. They are not um, uh, necessarily older Rwandans. These are Kenyans. Well, the situation has been described as cataclysmic uh, by the UN Human Rights Commissioner. Um, Irungu, thank you very much for that. Please, can we can we talk to you again when uh, the court is due to to pronounce categorically? Which I think is I think you said on the twenty sixth of January. Can we pick up again on this and let's follow the progress of this mission? But for now, Irungu Houghton of uh, Amnesty in Kenya talking to us from Nairobi. Thank you so much. Africa's oldest liberation movement is in trouble. South Africa's ANC has lost one of its most senior veterans who's quit because of chronic levels of corruption. Mavusu Unsamang laid into his beloved party for allowing the country to deteriorate so much that he predicts that for the first time since 1994 and the end of apartheid, the ANC could fail to get a majority in next year's election. So how big a deal is this for the ANC? Uh, that's a question for TV reporter and presenter Crystal Orderson, who's joining us now from Cape Town, Crystal, thank you very much for talking to us. How are you? Uh, good afternoon, Martin. It's a bright and sunny day in Cape Town. What more can I say? How big a deal is this, Crystal? So I think it is a shock because Mabuso Musmang was an ANC member for over 60 years. So we're talking the dark days of apartheid. He saw democracy. He was a senior civil servant within the former Nelson Mandela cabinet. He stayed committed throughout the dark days, which we call the Zuma era. And he didn't give up. He was the biggest campaigner for Cyril Ramaphosa during when he was campaigning for president. And now after 60 years, he's saying enough is enough. I just can't cope. And in his letter, he talks about how he, you know, remained committed throughout when people were starting to say the ANC is corrupt. There's no hope. He remained committed. But he said he doesn't believe that the corruption is going to end. He talks about the inequality. He talks about the high unemployment rate. He talks about crime. He talks about the lack of housing and that he feels that the ANC is simply not going to be able to deliver. And it's, of course, with a deep sadness that he um, handed in his resignation. And what was quite disappointing when Cyril Ramaphosa was asked about Mabusum Samang's resignation, he simply said, you know, while well, individuals can decide um, to resign or not. And for me, that was very telling of where the ANC is at right now, with a mere six months away to most probably the most important election since the fall of apartheid in 1994, the ANC knows that they are not going to get more than 50%. However, I am still of the view that it is, despite all that is happening and this shocking resignation of Mavusa Musimang, the ANC might still be able to pull it off getting the majority percentage of political parties in South Africa. And the reason why I'm saying that is that despite that we have new political formations and we just had one being launched on Sunday, South Africans at its core are still committed to the ANC. Um, I saw the Unsamang uh, interview that he gave to SABC and he was actually emotional. Um, I'm just wondering, after a, a 60 year stalwart of the oldest liberation movement on the continent, for him to quit. I mean, how representative is he of uh, South Africans in general and, and more specifically party members? I think it's interesting, Martin, and if one unpacks it, firstly, one could argue that does Mavusum Samang have a constituency? Is he active in his branch 
what is his constituency? And that, that is what, you know, some of kind of, you know, the kind of current ANC crowd will tell you, you know, he's old, you know, what does he represent? But the fact is, he does have a constituency. He's the deputy um, chair of the ANC Veterans League, which is the moral voice within the African National Congress. It is the voice that reminds the young ones, can you simply stop eating? How many... Um, Louis Vuitton bags do you really need? Um, it is our moral compass. And the fact that Mbusum Samang always reminded us um, about the ethos of the ANC, the ANC of Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Govan Mbeki, and the ANC of today is not the ANC that so many people died for. So I would disagree with those ANC comrades that are saying that, oh, well, dismissing Mavusumasumang. And in fact, the, the person who has been severely dismissive of this resignation is Fikile Mbalula, that is currently the Secretary General of the ANC. I mean, he's one of, he's basically the CEO of the ANC. And he has been absolutely dismissive, even accusing Mabusum Samang of going to join the Roger Jardine outfit. Um, and Mabuso had to, he was at pains to explain that this is not the case. I saw a senior ANC leader an hour after Mabusum Samang's letter started emerging within the WhatsApp groups. And he was immensely sad, um, Martin. I can't explain to you when I saw him. He just looked like someone who had lost a family member. And he said that this is deeply unsettling for an elder within the African National Congress to write an open letter that really describes what a lot of people are feeling. And so I do think that his resignation has caused a ripple effect within ANC members and a concern that six months to an important election, the ANC is starting to not be one cohesive voice. It, it's 10 years since um, uh, the great Najiba passed away, Crystal. Um, you've got that that uh, anniversary. You've also got the Mr. Mang letter, and then you've got the formation of this new party by Roger Jardine. Uh, I think that happened on Sunday. Uh, do you think all these events are coming together? Is there, is there a sense that uh, people are saying, right, now is the time to make a stand. We're going to do it now. Is there a kind of synchronicity going on here? I think it is, Patrick, and I think what is significant of the Roger Jardine movement um, that was launched on Sunday is that, one, these are all former ANC members. Roger Jardine, for instance, um, was the youngest director general in the Nelson Mandela cabinet. He left, um, you know, government to go into the private sector, and he was able to get a lot of the former United Democratic Front leaders in his formation, um, like Murphy Morobe, who was at the front, one of the senior leaders within the UDF. And so I don't think one can simply dismiss um, the formation of these new movements and the 10-year anniversary of the late Madiba's death, um, because I think it is a moment for the country and for those that are committed to seeing South Africa not, well, we are falling apart, but, you know, like that we still are able to ultimately address the high unemployment, address the high crime rate. And Roger Jardine is saying that we need like-minded people, organizations, to form a unique coalition um, for the 2024. And I think that, for me, is quite telling, Patrick, a unique coalition. We've had about four... Um, polls coming out the past three months, it is all telling us the same thing, that the ANC's majority is going to drop significantly below 50%. Perhaps there's no one party that's going to get a majority. And so our reality is that 2024, we need a coalition government. So in order for that to happen, we need to start having the conversations now about what shape or form that coalition government will take. And I think Roger is therefore putting his cards on the table to say, we are going to have a coalition in 2024. We need to have that conversation right now. But again, interestingly, Fikile Mbalula, ANC 
on the attack with Roger Jardine accusing him of being a plant of monopoly capital and specifically white monopoly capital, specifically the Stellenbosch mafia. They're already talking of like, you know, a hundred million dollars on a table for campaigning. And Roger dismissed it on Sunday. He's like, no, I haven't received this money. Um, and of course, everyone's going to say different things about me, but I'm adamant that I'm a committed South African. I want to see change in my country. We the ANC that we have in 2023 is not the same ANC that we had in 1994. And if we continue on this path, we are not going to have a future for our children and we need to address the rot. And if it means we do get business to help us fix the, the collapsed rail system or the collapsed electricity provider ESCOM, then that's what we're going to do. But we also need civic organizations who have been active in raising the dire socioeconomic issues in our country to be active. So I think ultimately the reality is, Patrick, he's talking to people like me who are, of course, middle class, who is concerned about the country, who doesn't have another passport, but how will he be able to translate that message that resonates with me and many others of my um, my friends, my colleagues, etc.? How does that resonate to rural areas or those that are unemployed? And that will be, I think, the big challenge for Roger Jardine is not just to get me and other middle class people buy into the message, which we do, but it's also that one in three unemployed young people across South Africa, that they also need to buy into that message. Um, Crystal, I find it so sad that the ANC, the African National Congress, the mighty African National Congress, the iconic African National Congress, that to which so many black people all over the world and Africa are emotionally committed because of the, the amazing role they played all those years, I, I'm almost moved to tears by the fact that it's falling apart and that, you know, some of its more distinguished members are leaving in despair. Do you think that these developments are going to make the ANC more introspective and start looking inwards and looking into ways in which it can stop the rot that has disillusioned so many of its members so many members of the cons its wider constituency. You know, does Namaphosa and, and, and do Ramaphosa and uh, Mbalula and others have what it takes to drag the ANC back from the brink? I wish I could say yes, they do, because when Cyril um, addresses events or rallies, which is what they've been doing, they talk about the ANC renewal. Um, but what's happening on the ground is not the case. And I don't say this lightly, Danu, because I, I always say I am a recipient of the 1996 class project of the African National Congress from a working class um, suburb, township, a mother who was a factory worker, a father who was a painter, to suddenly become a professional journalist, study abroad. So I do not take this lightly. And I, I sometimes feel personally that the ANC is deeply disappointing for all of us. Um, but the reality is when I see what's happening in communities, and actually yesterday I, I, I had a, a, a coffee with a longtime ANC comrade, you know, and she was also one of the youngest um, political analysts and advisors to ANC ministers. And we were talking about how deeply disappointing the ANC is, is that she lives in Johannesburg. She hasn't had power for seven days and she lives in Houghton, which is the suburb where Nelson Mandela former Nelson Mandela lived and Thabo Mbeki lived. And she said it's so deeply painful um, that this is the ANC that we had all hoped that would bring change. And as you just asked the question, Dono, I feel the disappointment that it's been not only for us, but for Africa. There was so much riding on this great liberation movement, last to get um, freedom in down south, southern most of Africa. We expected so much more. And so 
I would, in my in my most imaginative dream, I would be like, yes, there's going to be renewal. But when you see what's happening on the ground, unemployment increasing, crime increasing, um, a, a, a parallel mafia state developing, Donna, which is the reality of if you want to build a school, you need to pay someone off um, the, the high crime rate. That is all happening. And then we're talking of a collapse infrastructure our ports which were the busiest in africa they are you now have to wait there's seventy thousand um literally cargo boxes just waiting at sea we have um power cuts um you know that's the reality we are losing billions a day because we're not able to get our ports working we're not able to get our resources out of the country our big investors which is we manufacture cars in the east of the country, you know, VW, Toyota are all saying, well, you know, the power cuts are really making our life very difficult. That is the reality of it. And so do I see that the ANC is going to renew itself? The answer is no. Can I ask you something else, Crystal? Do, do, do the ANC, does the ANC leadership understand the moral responsibility it has? to its legions of at least people who used to be fans and would still like to be fans, do they, do they also not realize that in falling apart like this, they are proving right all the white fascists <laughs> who swore that if black people took over in South Africa, South Africa would degenerate to the level of other African countries like Nigeria. And I think that's why Mavusum Samang's letter is so painful, Danu, because he speaks to that. It's like, do you realize what you are doing? And the sad reality is when you engage with ANC comrades that are still in the party, they admit that there are some people that are just not getting it. All right. Can I jump in at that point and say a big thank you to you, Crystal? Um, that was a very interesting chat. and Really good to hear from you. Now, before we get into what happened and what didn't happen at COP28, Donu, tell us why in this case, size really matters and why Nigerians are grumbling. When I say size, I'm talking about 1,411. Explain. Well, there's, there's a huge furore in, at the Nigerian end when it was revealed that the uh, de Nigerian delegation to the COP28 um, conference in Dubai was uh, 1,400 strong. And nobody could understand why Nigeria needed so many people. And of course, the president came under attack. He issued a statement saying that he only paid for 412 or something, yeah, which still annoyed people. First of all, a lot of people just think, wonder why we have more than 20 people going to a conference in which we're not, we're not as important as we think we are. I mean, they tried to compare themselves to China, right? They said, well, the Chinese delegation was just as big or even bigger. I mean, why would China, which is rich and a net polluter of the planet, be put on the same level as Nigeria, which is basically much poorer than we'd like to admit? But could we, could we also suggest that uh, the size of the delegation perhaps denoted the seriousness with which Nigeria takes the issue, given that it's an economy based pretty much on the extractive industry. Could we can we look at it like that? Not at all. No, we cannot, because we know them. And we know that the main reason there were so many of them trooping off to Dubai <laughs> is because they cannot get visas to Dubai to shop under normal circumstances. So this was like an opportunity to hit the gold suits. Yes. They fool nobody and we're not impressed. <laughs> okay, all right. I will stop trying to play devil's advocate then. Um, so <laughs> COP28 is wrapping up as we speak. Final plenary is due to be underway about now. What was achieved? Did Africa get what it wanted? First, um, let's hear from Angelina Mensa. She's a Ghanaian delegate who sent us some voice notes from the conference in Dubai. I negotiated on two contentious agenda items, response measures, which was founded with the convention and the work program of the Just Transition, which evolved in Sharm El Sheikh COP27 in Egypt, that looks at accelerating the pathways of economic sectors. 
the pace has been very hectic. It's been odious. Early mornings, late nights, and in between we've had abeyances because we have something called procedural blockages. So when a party is in doubt of some legal explanation, sometimes we have to wait for about four hours, three hours waiting. In respect to the pace, we've also had to go to our hotel sometimes around 1.30 a.m. and get back by 7.30 a.m. to begin the day's work. The outcomes has been a bit contentious. We have divergent views. For instance, our developed partners in respect to response measures where we have an issue, the convention clearly states that parties should not take unilateral decisions in implementing trade policies. So we decided to have a work program in respect of that. And our developed partners are not very happy with it. One party, that is the United Kingdom, actually asked us to give an explanation or define what unilateral is all about. And that, by applying the law of propaganda, wasted all of us our time. So far, we don't know what is happening. We're waiting. But I think that Africa and the G77 and China have been able to push some of the agenda items, especially in response measures. Um, we're looking at the electric vehicles that we are supposed to deploy to decarbonize the world. We are looking at certain measures, that is the solar, the renewables. But then the thing is that the impact on Africa and developing countries have not been analyzed. And this is what we want to do. For example, in respect to electric vehicles, we are afraid of dumping and we are afraid of job losses. And these are the things that we are asking for and looking for and our partners are denying us that kind of work program. We are also looking at using tools and methodologies which are quite expensive to come by. And you need a lot of training for that. We, we have modelers all right, but there are certain modeling that needs the, we need the cooperation of the developed countries. And so basically we are having resistance from our parties in both agenda items that we are having in respect to just transition, the contention is around the definition of just transition and pathways. Right, so that was Angelina uh, who was expressing her frustration at uh, events in Dubai. Let's speak now to Najim Anima Sean, who's an energy consultant in Nigeria. Najim, um, thanks for talking to us. Now, you have been at the summit in Dubai. What's your assessment of uh, the final outcome? And I know we haven't seen a document yet. Uh, but I think we get the direction of travel, don't we? Well, I'm not too surprised by the final outcome. Um, I'm getting um, real life uh, updates from, from, from negotiators in the room who are telling me how difficult it is and how um, entrenched the, the OPEC lobby is in basically determining what goes into the draft. And there have been some fairly strong words uh, from uh, different uh, Groupings, different different countries and different groupings, and the most vocal amongst them are, are so far that I can see are the small island states, and I believe that the French and a few other developed countries, particularly Europe, are supporting them. But what I've also noticed is um, that the United States and China are quite muted about their um, their opposition to phasing out or phasing down fossil fuels. So the real battle is between uh, them on this issue, and I don't think they're going to make much headway on Article 6. And I don't think anybody expected them to make much headway on Article 6. So that, I think that's where we are at the moment. Um, what is Article 6, Najim? Yeah, Article 6 is the means by which we create a carbon trading system, um, a proper um, uh, measure of what it costs and uh, what, a, what, a, what a ton of carbon costs and what a ton of, ton of carbon sells for. And right now, nobody's anywhere near what the actual real cost is, which is closer to $2,500 per ton if you base it on current global GDP uh, and you divide global GDP by global emissions, you end up with 2,500 tons uh, <laughs> or 2,400 and, and change. 
and you can buy credits in the European trading system, emissions trading system for less than $200. So we're nowhere near what the real cost of carbon is, even to us in this time, not to mention what it's going to be like in 10 years time, given the impacts of the, the cascading impacts it will have on the economy. I wanted to I wanted to ask you about this issue that's being that's being portrayed as being the make or break issue, which is whether fossil fuels are agreed to be uh, phased out or phased down. Now, this is, as I say, the the issue that's being projected as as the as the success or failure of this summit. What what formula actually benefits a country like Nigeria, for instance, which is so wholly dependent upon um, oil exports? To answer your question, uh, Martin, is I have to go back to COP26 in Glasgow. Um, and why Glasgow? Because Glasgow was the very first time fossil fuels were named as the culprit for global warming. And that's the time when the fossil fuel industry had to take the mask off and actually appear at COP and defend itself. And this was the main opportunity for them to defend themselves. Now, for Nigeria, we could have organized ourselves since Glasgow to piggyback off this and actually benefit from the oil and gas industry, in particular, um, um, for, for purely national interest, uh, national interest, to try to get the benefits of what, what, what OPEC is trying to do. Now, those benefits are actually multiple. On the one hand, what, the, um, what they've done is to create uh, a greater urgency for voluntary carbon markets because European com com countries, and including China, have to now have a higher standard of ESG, environmental, social, and governance compliance requirements. And uh, with the EU establishing a carbon border adjustment mechanism regulation, a lot of the uh, uh, trade barriers are going to now be climate related. So for voluntary carbon markets for businesses, there is going to be quite a bit of adjustment not because they want to, but because they have to. So that would have benefited Nigeria because we have a lot of carbon credits to actually sell to people who are willing to buy it, and there'll be a lot more uh, demand for it now from the private sector. That is my assessment of, 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 of one of the su potential successes of this, or one of the potential takeaways that Nigeria could have taken from this COP had they had a more uh, moderately sized and, <laughs> and more focused delegation. <laughs> the second thing is that one of the things I noticed about the Nairobi Declaration, which was basically what Africa was presenting at, as its, 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 its platform for COP28, was the absence of four of Africa's largest oil-producing countries. And I'm talking about Angola and Algeria, Gabon and Equatorial Guinea. They were not part of the Nairobi Declaration. And it makes you wonder why um, and how they managed to... to, to, to I, I, there could be other reasons for it, but it just struck me as of the 11 countries that were not there, about half of them were oil producing countries who are essentially dependent on oil like Nigeria for their um, external foreign, foreign revenues. And in, in many cases, many of them are as hard up as Nigeria in terms of their debt profile. In fact, some, some of them are even worse. Angola is in a particularly bad shape. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how the small countries, particularly in a you know, um, Kenya, Ghana, or mid-sized Africa, because Kenya, Ghana, particularly Senegal, have actually come out of COP quite well. Um, Kenya launched its energy transition plan, and probably by the end of next year, by next COP, will have probably raised enough money to, to fund much of it. Senegal has, has did its energy transition plan a while ago and got about $4 billion pledged towards it. Now, the... A lot of the problems they have in Nigeria and in other African countries, and I'll stop after this point, is we really don't have Europe, China, or America competence within our administrations to be able to know what to negotiate, when to negotiate, and to try and actually leverage that um, advantage. So, for example, a country like Democratic Republic of Congo is sitting on huge leverage in terms of critical minerals. Uh, Zambia is... <laughs> with its copper, it's one of the main countries with critical minerals, and it's it can't even corral all its all its uh, uh, creditors in one place in COP and say, well, how about we swap some debt for climate? 
<laughs> and see where we can go with this, given that you need my copper. That we're not, we're not competent in that way to be able to actually leverage what we have to get what we want, or at least even half a, half a loaf of what we want. And so most of the African countries that I know came out of COP pretty badly um, because there were opportunities there to, to be a bit more realistic or to, to engage in more real politique uh, and less emotional blackmail. Okay, Najim, um, can I say a big thank you? Uh, that, was, that was very instructive and you gave us a, a, a really nice um, overview of the situation at COP vis-a-vis -vis Africa in particular. Najim, Thank you so much indeed for joining us. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. Now, we can't end this edition of the podcast without dipping into the Rwanda affair. Patrick, tell us why Paul Kagame is likely to be laughing all the way to the bank and why Kigali is the most talked about African capital in Britain today. Well, it, it's an amazing tale. and We've touched on it before. But it, it revolves around the Conservative government's uh, somewhat cockeyed scheme to process uh, asylum applications in Rwanda rather than Britain, the country that, to which the asylum applicants are first coming. So uh, about a year or so ago, when Rishi Sunak, uh, the Prime Minister of Britain, stood for election, he said he was going to stop the boats. That's uh, these boats which the people smugglers are organising from the coast of France to come across the, the channel to, to land in Dover and places like that. And then as soon as they land, they then go to the authorities and they, they claim, claim political asylum. So what uh, Sunak said is that all those people who land in those boats are going to be sent to Rwanda and they're going to have their asylum claims Assess then, and if they're eligible for political asylum, they're going to have to stay in stay in Rwanda, and that's where they're going to be. the The problem with that is that the the courts in in Britain, uh, in particular the Supreme Court, has judged uh, Rwanda not to be a safe place for asylum seekers to have their claims processed, or indeed to to stay after those claims are judged to be valid. So um, there is an almighty row. Uh, meanwhile, the British government has paid Paul Kagame, Paul Kagame's government, I should say, the sum of $300 million to set up this scheme. Yet not one single asylum seeker has been processed in Rwanda. In fact, not one single plane has left London for Rwanda with an asylum seeker on it. So, so far, the whole scheme has been absolutely theoretical. And the final piece of the madness is that the government could actually fall on this because you've got a, a situation where Sunak has now staked his political career on getting this new version of the Rwanda asylum bill through Parliament, which has the audacity to claim, um, as far as the, the civil rights community would argue, that the courts don't count anymore. The parliament has passed a, rule, a law which says that Rwanda is a great place. It's absolutely safe to send an asylum seeker to Rwanda. So we don't actually have to take any notice of our courts, which say it isn't safe. And most of all, we don't have to take any notice of the European Court for Human Rights, which has reached the same conclusion that Rwanda is not a safe place to process asylum claims. So there you have it. Uh, Sunak is putting the uh, reputation of the country on the line. That's it for this edition of the Africa Now podcast. We'd really like to hear your thoughts, your suggestions. We aim to cover the length and the breadth of the continent to contact us with issues that you'd like us to look at. Africa Now podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. I'm on X or Twitter, at Martine Dennis. Now, our next edition is a really special one. We've got an interview with Monica Mafias. She's the daughter of Equatorial Guinea's first president, Francisco Mafias, who spent her formative years in North Korea. Now, Monica may be African on the outside, but she tells me inside her soul is Korean. So don't miss Monica's fascinating story of growing up black in Pyongyang the two of the most reviled dictators in history as fathers. Now, remember, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review. We recorded this on Tuesday, December the 12th, 2023. 
with the technical skills of Matthew McConway. Anne Busby is our producer. Our original music is by Emric Adam. Thanks to our guests, Irungu, Crystal, Najim and Angelina from Donu, Patrick and me. Thank you for your company and our best wishes for the holiday season.